look at this full house of smiling faces. Good evening and welcome to the Glenn Gould stu Studio. My name is Teresa Scandifio. I'm the programmer for In Conversation with Series and the Senior Director of Learning for all of our year-round programming at TIFF Bell Lightbox. Welcome to tonight's In Conversation with Hilary Swank. <laughs> to begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. Tomorrow night concludes this year's In Conversation with series at the festival with Academy Award-nominated Golden Globe winner, Maggie Gyllenhaal. If you, thanks guys. If you want more information, tiff.net. So with a, with a career spanning more than 20 years as one of Hollywood's most dynamic, genuine, and nuanced voices, Hilary Swank epitomizes what it means to be a consummate professional as an actor and producer. A two-time Academy Award winner, Swank has worked with such leading filmmakers as Clint Eastwood, Christopher Nolan, Mira Nair, Danny Boyle, the list goes on. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Hilary Swank on stage for a conversation about her illustrious and humbling career you will know what I mean when we're at the end of it. Humbling filmography that demonstrates her continued work centering the, story, centering the stories of people who persevere through adversity, including her latest film to play in our festival's gala section, What They Had. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest, Hilary Swank, to the stage. Thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for that beautiful introduction, really. Thank you everyone for coming here tonight. Oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> so for those of you that are new to the In Conversation With format, we are going to have um, a conversation that, uh, because she has uh, an insanely brilliant filmography and uh, body of work, we're only gonna touch on a bit of her work. We will have clips to show you, but then we are going to throw it to the audience to ask questions, to kind of deepen the experience, because we're all in this together. So we're going to dive right in. It was um, amazing to learn that you know you started off with school plays in grade school, and then seemingly jumped right in in high school years and teen years into full-blown professional gigs. Um, thinking about some of the work that you've done in um, in TV and film that we'll see in a second. Um, growing up. What was it about acting that you loved? Well, I, I feel so lucky that I knew at a, such a young age that I wanted to be an actor because I got kind of a head start, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I think that that's a blessing. And I, to find something that you love so much that ignites your passion. And um, for me, I, I think we've all felt like an outsider at some point in our lives. And for me, it was when I was younger and I was living in a trailer park and I didn't know that that was seen as a certain way um, by some people, and um, and so feeling kind of ostracized and in in that place, I would read books and I'd watch movies that had characters that felt feelings I was feeling, and so I could relate to them. And immediately, I thought I didn't know it was something you could do as a career. Yeah. Um, but then I just started auditioning for the school play. And I actually one of my teachers had us write a skit in front of the class, and I was eight years old, and I remember doing it, and I remember coming alive. I remember thinking this is so much fun and I loved the reactions and like, uh, you know, and, and playing with the class and, and he said, you should audition for a school play. And so that kind of began the, the, the momentum of that. And I auditioned for the school play and then one thing led to another and I was doing local repertory theater um, in my town of Bellingham, Washington. And um, my mom came to a crossroads in her life and she said, you know, if you really want to do this, I think we have to go to Los Angeles. And um, I was auditioning at, at Seattle Repertory Theater at that point and we moved to Los Angeles, yeah, with $75 and um, lived out of our car. <laughs> and, so, it's, and people go, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I was like, no, that's a dream come true. <laughs> tell, us, tell us why it's a dream come true. Also, a mother that would say, okay, let's, Let's yeah. follow your dream. Yeah. 
it's my, pretty rare. It's the, my mom really gave me the greatest gift in that she believed in me and she said, you can do anything you want as long as you work hard enough. And so I just never questioned that you can achieve your dream be, if you don't work hard, I just so it was. I never took no as a a, a thing to think as to define that it wasn't going to happen. I just took it as okay. Well, this isn't going to work out, and there's another opportunity that I have to find and work for. Um, and that's a great gift you can give a child. I don't think there's any better gift you can give a child. My mom was at a crossroads in her life too, so she needed the change up for herself too. And now my mom still lives in Southern California and has a great job and is in a beautiful relationship and. So it was right for her to follow all of that, too. Um, but um, what was your question? <laughs> this is why she's so awesome, so generous. Because <laughs> I forget. <laughs> well, we are just initially talking about what, what it was about acting, but also just, you know, about general experiences. I guess the follow-up question to this would be, so you and your mother arrive to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Now what? Like, how do you even start in the industry? I'm thinking of yeah. emerging performers in this audience who are like, okay, I have my $75 in car, Yeah, I'm in Hollywood, what did Hillary do next? He, well, my, we learned that you have to have an agent, and to get an agent, you usually have to have some type of resume uh, or a headshot, and we didn't have any of that. So my mom went to the Samuel French bookstore and got a book of agents. And she got a roll of quarters and stood at a payphone and called these agents. And at one point, there was this agency called the Harry Gold Agency that said, oh yeah, we're looking for new talent. A lot of people, I guess, look for new youth talent. And mm -hmm. um, they said, you know, come in on Wednesday and we'll meet you. And so we went in and I remember vividly, like it was yesterday, this... Um, these two women, and they had me read. It wasn't to audition for McDonald's. It was to audition for them to represent me. So mm -hmm. I read this McDonald's commercial, and they gave me some notes, and I took their notes and their direction, and I read it again, and they said, well, congratulations, you have an agent. <laughs> so I went out, and I was like, Mom, I got an agent. Um, and um, she, this woman, her name was Bonnie Leadkey, and she's still an agent in Hollywood. She was a very, very, very pivotal, obviously my first agent, but also a pivotal force in my career because she had a really strong work ethic, and she encouraged me to do everything, um, to, to always learn and to never give up and to keep going and going and going. And that is the work ethic of my parents. And yeah. so that worked with the way I like to work. And she was my agent until um, I was an adult because she was a child agent. So when I turned, you know, like my, my early 20s, she wasn't my agent anymore, but she was my agent for a long time. And, um, and you know, it entailed just hitting, you, you know, there were so many auditions that I did I can't even, I wouldn't even be able to count how many auditions I went on before I ever even got the opportunity to go into growing pains and pull a bunny out of a hat and say, ta-da! Um, I, the one thing that I would encourage you guys is to just never give up and um, to, to never knock an opportunity to grow. I just auditioned for everything because I thought, you know, if I if I if I get that opportunity just to, to work with people and collaborate with people and mm -hmm. you know that when the time does come when there's that role that I really want, I'll this will help prepare me for that. So the first clip we are going to show goes back a bit. It <laughs> is your starring role in the next karate Ta -da! kid. No, no. no. Okay, the starring role this is what I'm telling you, we miss so many key moments. <laughs> we miss growing pains. Uh, the next Karate Kid and um, a scene from 90210. So if we could roll the clip, we'll then talk about her brilliance. Right? Wow. <laughs> What's so striking is that from a very young age, you were pay playing these like badass young women, those roles, I mean, think about how many leading starring roles there are for young women now. So like the next Karate Kid, being able to play that role, I'm thinking about all of the roles that you auditioned for and being able to get to play characters like this is pretty rare, no? I like that you look at it that way. <laughs> 
I really do. I'm not kidding because I was watching that and thinking how devastated I was that I got fired off the show. And thinking, wow. <laughs> You're like, why did I agree to this interview? <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking what, just watching it, I, it's, it's, you know, it's not like it's like the classiest scene, you know? Yeah, but, but um, think about all of the young women that were watching and how many characters were just kind of like these bobbleheads. Yeah, that's, and you yeah, get to watch you're this right. woman who's, who's a single who's mother who's strong yeah, and yeah, who's yeah, just yeah. kind of like, you're bullshit, I'm going to call it and then you just walk out. It's yeah. like, That's you know, like a Rosalind Russell move or something. <laughs> but so Thank you. what kind of movies or what kind of TV shows were you watching that you, you know, you're talking about these formative role models that you have off screen with your mother and your agent, which is frankly very rare to yeah. have two people repeating or an agent repeating the work ethic and cultural values of your family. But on screen, who were you seeing on screen and you were thinking, mm. yes. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, it's so cliche, but it, cliches are there for a reason. But I was watching Meryl Streep, mm -hmm. and I was watching the choices that she made that really um, captured difficult choices and um, being a woman in, in uh, you know, often a man's world, especially in that time, and um, navigating that with strength and beauty and... Um, persevering. You know, one of the things you said earlier when you introduced me was persevering through adversity, and that's one of the things that inspires me the most in any human being, whether it's an actor or these, a lot of the true stories that I've been so blessed to play. Um, so it's really um, not just actors, but just real life people that I come into contact with and meet, and I think a big part of acting is um, empathizing, really. So you're talking about playing real life characters. In yeah. 1999, you played uh, Brandon Tina in Boys Don't Cry. Mm -hmm. And yes. Thank you. That was a blessing to be a and, part of. Thank you. And you know, you won an Oscar for it. You won a Golden Globe. Uh, this is based on a real life story. Can you tell everyone who Brandon was? Yes, so Brandon Tina, well, what's kind of just mind blowing is we were born in the same hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and Brandon Tina was born Tina Brandon two years before I was. Um, and so we grew up in the same kind of environment. And um, I would say that just in general, that area, you know, is not really open minded to different ways of life because mm -hmm. you don't experience it and see it very often and it's not in a city where you see a lot of different cultures and ways of life um, and so um, at one point um, Tina Brandon um, I, I mean I don't know if you could say identified with being a man if she was very clear that she was transgendered she just said she had a sexual identity crisis um, and was and preferred to be uh, known as, as Brandon Tina and pass as a boy and um, but was unfortunately murdered before um, he got the opportunity to say that I, I am transgendered, I do want to have, you know, possibly a sex change or, um, so we don't really know the full definition of what this person would have, have, have called themselves if they had the opportunity to live out their life. But what we did learn is that this was happening and is still happening in this country and in this world, um, and it's, um, it's 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 just a horror to think that 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 someone um, who um, is trying to find love and receive love um, and give love um, is murdered for the choice of how they want to do that. It's there's there's um, no excuse for that. Um, and it was the beginning of a conversation that movie, and I think we've come. I think we've come a long way, but we still have so much more to go. You know, the casting process took over three years. Mm -hmm. um, did you know that you had similar, you know, beginnings in life experiences? What, what was the driving force for you for three years of, you know, trying to get this role? And how did you prepare for it? Well, actually, they, I think they were casting for three years. Um, but when I heard about it, I got cast about three weeks after I auditioned. 
Oh wow. Yeah, so I think they were looking and I didn't I just had didn't know about it. Um and um and so when I went in and I auditioned, actually kind of to go back, we were talking a little bit before we came out here and I was talking about um, you know, hitting the pavement and auditioning and auditioning yeah. and constantly, you know, we're 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 often told, you know, well you look like this and so you should play this role and you, you know, are people like to pigeonhole you, right? And they like to put you in a box and say, this is what you do. Um, and um, Carrie Barton um, and Jennifer McNamara cast Boys Don't Cry, and they were often casting a lot of projects that I wanted to audition for. And a lot of times they would say, oh no, we know you, Hillary, you're not right for this. And I would crash their auditions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd walk in and they'd say, oh, Hillary, we told you. And I was like, that's okay. And they're like, well, we have a whole list of people we're seeing. And I'm like, you have to wait. And I was like, I'll wait. And sometimes it would be four hours later. But what's great is that they were open-minded and they didn't hold a grudge with that. I think in some way they might have appreciated that I was so passionate. Um, and they ended up, I, they cast that movie. So it was nice to have that kind of come full circle. But um, so to, to answer your question, it was three weeks. I, I remember going in and auditioning um, and kind of just doing, scratching the surface of what I would do with the character because I read yeah. the script and I had audition sides and that was really it. And, um, and then they asked me to go to New York to meet with Kimberly Pierce. Um, and my uh, manager at the time said, well, you guys have to pay for her to go to New York. And they said, we don't have it in the budget to fly someone to New York, so if, you know, Kimberly has to fly here. She's gonna see a whole bunch more people and we're gonna open this back up. And my agent was like, get your ass on the plane. <laughs> Just this is really, you know, you love this role and you feel passionate about this movie and the message of the movie. And so I went there, I flew there, I met with Kimberly and, um, and then I got it and I, and right away started, um, you know, passing as a boy and I cut my hair off like the next day. and. So did you, because this is based on a real life, like what was the research process for you? Well, there wasn't a lot of information other than what you see in the movie um, about the character. So a big part of it was um, passing as a boy in public so that, because I knew that when I was doing the scenes in the movie that the actors were just gonna say what the lines were and pretend that they believed that I looked like a boy. But I really wanted to know what made, made me really pass because Brandon Tina was walking around in Lincoln, Nebraska, passing as a boy. Um, and so I cut my hair um, and I started the process of what worked in public and what didn't. Mm. And I went back to my house in California and I went at home, I went into that house and I told my neighbors that I was Hillary's cousin James from Iowa. <laughs> and um, I just started in my neighborhood Wow. And um, and then and and then sometimes when I was in a restaurant, if I asked for something, you know, and someone would, would use the pronoun she, I would think, oh, what did I do just now that didn't work? Um, mm -hmm. And so I would just keep going until uh, and working on that. And I had about four weeks of preparation for that. Um, and I think one of the most important things that came from that process was that I was no longer uh, a gender that people could define and how that, I don't know, threatened some people's own uh, security and way of seeing the world. And, yeah. and so I got to scratch the surface of what it felt like to walk in this world um, not being definable and how you're treated. And um, I can say that the, the, the movie, and it still makes me emotional because I just, I have so much empathy um, for anyone who's, you know, trying to live their life. And, and, and it's a difficult life enough um, mm -hmm. to be walking as someone that people can define. And um, it was a really hard movie to come out from under, to know that someone was murdered for that choice. And, um, you know, everyone has their place in this world and everyone... Um, is trying to figure out their lives. And so that was really, to, to, to be so defined as a woman and to be treated a certain way and then all of a sudden I'm the same person that wasn't definable and I was, completed, I was treated completely differently. You had mentioned um, this film being about someone so young but also being about love. Mm -hmm. And the clip 
we will show you tonight is Brandon with his girlfriend, Lena. So why don't we show this clip and then we'll continue the conversation. Thank you. You mentioned, um, you know, coming out of these roles and we're going to see and talk about a lot of different roles that Hillary has played and you never shy away from going there in these roles of characters and humans that are experiencing immense obstacles. What do you do, or at this age you were very young playing this role, how did you protect yourself in, in coming out of some of these roles? And Well, I think when you're playing a real person and something like that happens to them, you don't really come out from under it. It's it's because they're not here any longer, and mm -hmm. you know that. It's not fictional where you can separate and say, oh, this didn't really happen, this didn't really happen. It really happened, and clearly it still affects me to this day. I, 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 I'm, you know, I just, it boggles my mind, and um, I, I was the spokesperson for the gay, lesbian, transgender, and questioning youth for 12 years after that, and I helped them build an accredited high school in New York City, and, um, it's something that you don't ever get out from under until it's no longer happening, mm -hmm. you know, until everyone can walk safely in this world. So you mentioned, yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned all the work you did. Um, a few years ago, you received an Outf at Outfest Legacy Award for the work that you did in this film, and then also championing LGBTQ plus rights. Um, you know, what role does TV and film play? You know, what role has it played, but what role can we see, imagine in the future, playing for creating a more equitable society when it comes to um, these community members who are treated horrendously. Yeah, I think the in inclusivity, um, but across the board with different races and different creeds and, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think that we're really an exciting time for women right now mm -hmm. um, in the women have been trivialized and objectified for so long. And, you know, so a across the board, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think as long as we continue to talk about it and to create opportunities for everyone because the beauty of art is that everyone has a place within it, you know, and to have a business for so long be run by by white men, it it was so polarized and it was really one way of seeing things and that's just not the way the world is. If you step outside of the film industry or you step outside of some arts, right? You, it's, it's, it's so much bigger than that. So we, I think, are on an exciting, it's a precipice of excitement because w when Boys Don't Cry was made, it was one movie. Yeah. And yeah. Um, now there's been a lot of other uh, uh, films and TV shows um, that, that show all the different ways in which people live and walk in this world, and yep. um, and I think we're we're going to continue to do that. I think there's more opportunities now for more content than ever with all the streaming and all the other different ways and platforms. So I think it's an exciting time, but I think we have to continue to talk about it, yeah, and to create those opportunities. It's amazing to think that that film was 20 years ago, and the yeah. conversation that is only recently now getting into the mainstream. I know. Um, the you know, I have been following your career since that film, but watching all of the films um, over again in, in preparation, it's like these characters are phenomenal. Um, the, the next kind of big moment that we're going to jump to in this conversation, because um, I would love for it to be like a 20 hour conversation, but <laughs> I don't know, um, is, you know, thinking about your seminal role in the formidable uh, character of Maggie in uh, Million Dollar Baby. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this performance won you your second Oscar. Let's roll a clip 
from Clint Eastwood's Million Dollar Baby, and then we'll start talking a little bit about this character and um, Hillary's performance. Thank you. That is just, I mean, that's, it's a, um, an always a dream come true, you know, getting to collaborate with Clint Eastwood. And I've never read a more perfect script. There wasn't one word that was changed. Mm. Paul Haggis just wrote a beautiful story. And Clint is Clint. And Morgan is Morgan. And it is a complete dream come true. And I was... I was 29 when I filmed that, and the last day of filming was on my 30th birthday, and I remember thinking, I don't know if it's gonna get better than this. Mm. You know, and I'm only 29, about to turn 30. Like, um, and I just soaked up every moment on that set with those iconic people. It's amazing that you had perspective at a young age to, to know that you're in this moment. Um, I read in an interview that you said, thinking about Maggie's character and her kind of being fueled by boxing, that that is how you feel about acting and performing. Um, what is it that drives you to that point where you, know, you will tussle, you will show up to that, um, that audition, even if you're not invited, that you will just, you know, it's not no, it's not yet. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for saying that, for recognizing that. I, I just have this insatiable curiosity about people and um, what makes them tick and what makes them alike and what mm -hmm. makes them different. And I feel the most alive when I'm telling stories about people that make me think bigger and make me and blow up on my blinders of how I see the world. And I feel so enriched by these people. Every single person that I've played has a place in my heart. And, um, um, and I, when I'm acting and collaborating, I love the collaboration process so much. And it's, it's always a, a lesson to, there's something to learn. And I really love to learn. So, it's like the per perfect amalgam of all these things that I love all in one place and it just brings me so much joy. You talked about collaboration and you talked about character building. Uh, what was it like to work with an actor director on this, on this project and, and others? Well, in, in, in the case of Clint, um, you know, you meet him and it's, it's, so, it's so intimidating because oh. He, you know, he's Clint Eastwood, and yeah. he and and he quickly makes you feel very comfortable because he's just this breath of fresh air, and he's so real. And he's really, you know, I hate to like ruin your your idea of like go ahead make my day, <laughs> but he's a complete teddy bear, <laughs> and he um, he's just a total love, and he's funny and. He stands in the lunch line, you know, he doesn't cut and he doesn't ask for someone to bring him his lunch. He stands and waits behind everyone because everyone needs to eat. That's the kind of guy Clint is. And, um, but when you're working with your director who you're also acting with, yeah. in the beginning, I was doing a scene with him and I could see that he was like kind of looking at me like the director. <laughs> and I was like, Wait, this is, I've never looked at my director while I've done a scene. This is really interesting. And I, I how am I going to work through this? And then as we got to know each other, we became more comfortable with one another. Um, and he became more comfortable with my, you know, how, where I was going with the character. And then he was getting deeper into his character and in the scenes. Um, I felt less and less that I was sitting with my director and I was sitting with, you know, the boss. So... So you, you know, your curiosity, your drive, your tenacity, it's, it's very evident. Does this mean that you are someone who likes to have a lot of takes? Or you like it to be prepared ahead of time? It's a good question. Where does that tilt with you? I'm, I don't like a lot of takes. Oh. Um, I like a few takes, um, maybe four, 
but somewhere in the threes because I just like to try a variation and I think it's important to give a director a variation. And because when you're editing, I think when a director has is in the in the in the room editing, they might say, oh, it would have been better to be angry only once in this place. And now we have these two angry yeah. things and there's and that's just an example. And um, you know, and it would have been better if it was nuanced here and this was something different. So I'd like to try and give choices um, for myself too, um, to play the character and find the character as you're going. But I think for the most part, and I think a big part of it was my training in television, because you television is moving so quickly and you don't get more really than one, two takes. And you also, they're cutting it so quickly that they're not looking for your best performance. They're just getting it cut together to get it on air. So p part of my training was to get it all in one take. That'd be terrifying that it's just whatever random clip they find that they edit together. It's Not yeah. that I'm a perfectionist or anything, but that'd be very <laughs> uncomfortable to be like, oh, this one's good. Yeah. And you're like, ah, my third one was really good. Yeah, but it's, it's, it is really good training, and especially when you're working with someone like Clint, who does, is notorious for one take. So it, and I am really prepared, but yeah. I, people. That's not surprising to <laughs> any of us in here. But I'm, I'm really prepared for a, a myriad reasons. And one of the reasons is that it helps me squash my fear. Mm -hmm. So. Totally. You were talking about curiosity and always wanting to learn. Um, and while you were saying, you know, the curiosity and learning, I was like, oh, so that's why as you're perfecting your acting craft, you're like, okay, now I'm gonna also produce, and I'm gonna start doing these other kind of projects, and that's a, another, you know, when you're talking about empathy and seeing from another lens, that's a totally other lens to see the project. In something like um, Conviction, um, how did that project, you know, how did you see that project and say, yes, this story needs to be told, and then again, with real life story, how did you as the producer and then as the actor make decisions on how this story would come to life? It's a really good question. I think that, first of all, I jumped at the chance to play Betty Ann Waters. She's this force of nature who, you know, has the qualities that you're talking about in a lot of the characters I play. She's, a, she's really a, this force of nature that will never give up mm -hmm. until justice is served. And... Um, getting to meet her and to see her utter conviction um, in conviction, is that the word? In her brother. You know, that she um, believed from the beginning that he didn't do this and when no one else believed that. I mean, clearly he was on death row. And um, that she was a high school dropout and she got her GED, and then she went to college, and then she went to law school to get her brother out of, off death row. That is commitment <laughs> at its finest, and she is just, um, it's, that's an inspiration. And so I jumped at it, but as far as being an actor and, and a producer, there's, I think you th I understand the inner workings of, of a film. At, you know, I've been doing it now for 29 years, right. and I think that you get this great opportunity to help see a movie get to the screen that you really believe in. And part of that is championing the, the director, really, and their vision and helping that vision get to the screen by pulling favors or, you know, because making a movie is nothing short of a miracle sometimes. I mean, even on that film, we were, the day before, we didn't even know if our financing was gonna come in. And the crew was like, gosh, if we don't get paid, I'm so sorry, but we can't stay. And, and, you know, and then it just came in like by the hair of our chins. And so you're constantly working to keep a, a movie together when it's low budget films. What was it like to balance both staying in the headspace of the character and advocating off screen for all the moving parts? Well, I think that I work better when I'm multitasking. Mm -hmm. Just my, I, I, it, it probably leaves me, yeah, yeah, it leaves me less time to worry. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> um, I found a quote from you that I loved, and I hope it's okay if I read it. As an independent woman myself, as a woman who for all intents and purposes people will probably call bossy, I have a real clear idea of how I see the world and how I want to live the world, and I want to see my dreams realized. 
You said this in reference to why you chose to play the character of Mary B. Cuddy in Tommy Lee Jones' Holmesman. Tell us about Mary B. Um, Mary B. was so ahead of her time. You know, she, um, she, I think that was one of the movies that I had so much fun on. Um, I have fun on a lot of my movies, but that was a lot of fun because I was also in the middle of New Mexico and I was riding a horse and I would, um, between scenes, um, get a go out in the middle of nowhere on a horse and learn lines and then they'd give me a 10 minute warning and I ride my horse back and I'd ride my horse back to my trailer and I'd ride my horse to lunch and I, <laughs> <laughs> I love horses. Um, but um, also <laughs> it's just, um, she was uh, also, she was so, she wore her heart on her sleeve and um, she was also about doing the right thing and she had values and morals. And I feel like those are some qualities that are lacking nowadays. And I really appreciate people who can just say it how it is. I feel like beating around the bush loses so much time and it doesn't allow people to just learn about themselves and learn about how to um, just, I don't know, you know, it's like, just let's get to it. Let's get to it so we can all live our fullest potential. We don't need to, you can, you can have creative, creative uh, criticism and, and you know what I mean? And, and, and get, and get to yeah. the heart of it. And I like that about her. Yeah. So can you um, tell the audience what she was, what her quest was, like what she was trying to achieve? in the film for people who haven't seen it yet? Well, um, she was a woman on a journey to, um, well, in that time, it was a really dangerous time. It was before there were trains and it was before there was medicine and you get sick, you pretty much die. Um, and there were the real uh, danger of, of Indians and how we were infringing on their land and they were trying to protect themselves and, um, but how do you find food and how do you keep warm? And she was um, in a town trying to be proactive with her community and she was um, a forward thinker in her town and um, trying to help other women, essentially. And um, at that time, women were, there was, they, they were losing their minds because they were either had famine or, you know, the, the disease and, um, and she was, wanting to help them on, 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 and, um, and she was really just morally a good woman. I don't know, is that helpful? Are you guys like, what is yeah. this movie about? Why don't we, <laughs> why don't we watch uh, the next clips from Conviction and Helmsman? Right, there's that through line from Carly and how she says it, how it is for that, thank you. I was just saying that there's that, when you said there's that through line from Carly Reynolds and saying how, how it is to that <laughs> scene, I see it now. It's funny. So good, so <laughs> good. The, um, these characters, all of these characters, um, they're not traditional heroes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of obstacles in their way. Um, they have, you know, all of these strengths, but they also have these blind spots. When you're playing these roles, when you're thinking about the audience, how do you do these performances without having it be perceived or flattened out as the female archetype of the victim? Mm. Well, I feel like, you know, they're flawed humans and they're trying to find their way amongst uh, the, the in, within the movie and, um, and they're, I don't think that any of them are victims, they're just having their life and they mm -hmm. have fallen on unfortunate circumstances and we've all had those moments, some are way greater than others um, and I think that, um, but that's what we relate to, right? It's like the idea that we all go through unfortunate moments and we, even though they're different, the feeling is still the same within them and um, so I guess that, that's, that's how I see those characters, you know, and to play them as a victim would be a disservice because I don't think they see themselves like that. 
Well, to see Mary B. Cuddy in this role, just being in the scene, being like, cut the crap, this is your gig. And also that the dig would be like, you're a man of low character. It's like, he's a drifter. Um, but, <laughs> but then in the next scenes, when they're picking up these women and their children are there and she's showing such compassion for it, the range in it is, is incredibly brilliant. I kept thinking about with your films about how it's so good that now there are more female critics to write reviews, to see all of the multidimensional aspects of these scenes. That's so interesting you say that, because last night I was having a conversation with someone in, um, from The Hollywood Reporter, and he mm -hmm. said for the longest time they had eight white men as their critics forever until last October. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so I mean, in all diversity, right? We need racialized critics. We yeah. need people from all different perspectives. Exactly. It is bananas. Yeah. Um, that's my official term. <laughs> um, so I know I can see this massive clock that's running down that's making me sad. But um, I want to make sure there's time for the audience Q&A. Um, we have a couple more clips to show. Uh, the next clip is from the latest TV project, Trust. And just to set up the scene, Gail, the daughter-in-law of an oil tycoon, uh, you may have heard of, him, heard of him, John Paul Getty, investigates her son's kidnapping by the Italian mafia, despite Getty's conviction that the kidnapping is a hoax. So let's watch um, the clip from Trust. It's getting. Thank you. So you return to TV and long form storytelling is in a very different place from when you started. Yes. Bringing back to that curiosity and learning what for you as an actor, what opportunities are there for you in long form that uh, maybe aren't there for you in film? Well, what's interesting is I thought for a long time that my, my medium as an artist was film because I like to really get into the character in a deep way, play it, let it go, and then find another character to play. Um, but what I recognize in, 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 a, kind of in a limited series, I mean, I, I was in eight episodes of the 10 here, but I would have enjoyed the collaboration if it went on for even a couple more years. And what the, the one biggest thing that I recognize, which was really a, a great opportunity, is in a two hour film, approximately, you have, you know, it's like the moment where there's the, you know, the, the falling down and then getting back up and then the, 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 the almost giving up and then the, the crying and then the anger and the, you know, they're, they're those moments and mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're very clear in the script. But in a long form, you get the opportunity to dive into the gradations of those moments. So you, you know, of the emotion, all the different gradations of an emotion rather than one opportunity to portray it in that one way. And anger or, you know, yeah. whatever the emotion is. And that is really a, it's like a master class of acting, you know, because you have to find a different way to play that the next time. You don't want to revert back to something you've already done. You don't want to have the same beat every time. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. It's fun. Um, your latest project, you're the executive producer and starring in what they had. Um, what drew you to this project? Like, why tell this story? Well, it's so, after talking about so many of the wonderful opportunities that I was blessed to be a part of and to come to this role, um, strangely, it was the role that I felt the most vulnerable in because it wasn't really a character of... Um, that I was falling into and becoming, it was almost like I was playing more me than any character, even though there are parts of me in every character that I've played, every single one, including Tina Brandon. Um, but it was just this woman finding her way and, and reminding herself to trust her instinct and to remind herself that, you know, by nature, women are nurturers and we oftentimes forget to take care of ourselves. And at 40, if you're not living your authentic self, what are you doing? Right? And so many of the women that I have in my life that I know, we really struggle with that, finding that time and putting our oxygen masks on first and so that we're able to be there for other people. And, um, and, and constantly asking ourselves, is this what I want to do with my life? Am I doing, am I living my life? And so there was that component that I really loved about my character and the idea of being seen 
really being seen for who we are. Um, and then it's just also a beautiful love story. And it's a love story between um, a mother and a daughter and a, a husband and a wife and a brother and a sister. And it's multi-generational. It deals with family dysfunction, but the love within that dysfunction, which we all can relate to. There's so many relatable moments for any type of person. Mm -hmm. that can see this and so far what's been great and he being here at TIFF and doing press and talking about it with different people is how it's affected people because it also deals with dementia and so many people are afflicted by that or know someone who is and what are you if you don't have your memories like we are made up of our memories so what are you when you're not that and who are the people around you when you're not that when you don't have that anymore so it deals with a lot of real life things, even though it's not necessarily, a, well, it is a true story in, of sorts, because it's Elizabeth Tomko's, it's her first, it's her directorial debut, and she is a someone to watch for sure. She's gonna have, I think, a really meaningful career. She's a um, real advocate of women. She is an advocate of people. She um, is egoless, and this is her story. Let's watch a clip from Elizabeth Tromko's What They Had. Thank you. Blythe Danner is so sublime in this movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's her best performance. She's so good, and I think it takes a lot of courage to play a role like that. It's, it's, um, she really relied a lot on Elizabeth to help her, and they had a beautiful relationship watching them work and find that character together. So. Before we throw it to the audience, I want to implore all of you to see this film. Um, you mentioned the multi-generational. For people that have siblings, there are many scenes that you're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> True. For the multi-generational with you know, the parent, the grandparent, and the child, but also just more generally, if you think about any kind of personal dynamic that you have with people in a community, and someone passes away or their memory goes and, their ro and your roles change, what that can do to your worldview and to your personal life and it throws all of these things into a totally different flurry and Hilary Swank was exquisite in it. So it's playing tomorrow night here. Um, make sure if you haven't already got tickets that you get tickets either here or when it, when it plays. Um, so let's throw it to the audience to ask some questions. Thanks for that. Um, thank you. Look at I all these beautiful see you faces. Now. Hi again. So I think the microphone is there with yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Madeline Allard. I just want to say that I have admired you for a long time thank as well you. as the roles you've played. Um, my question specifically is if you were to follow uh, Clint or Kimberly or Elizabeth in a directorial debut and you had one person you wanted to adapt as a biopic, who would you pick? Oh, wow, that's really specific. <laughs> <laughs> I like specificity, but wow, when I don't have any time to think about it. I, I, um, jeez. Um... I'm really bad with names. Can you help me? What's the dancer, the ballerina, who was told she didn't have the body type and she... Oh. Yeah. That's who I tell my story about. Thank you. Thank you for that question and your comments. Oh, yep. The, wherever the person with the mic is fly, flying. What are the biggest things you learned about life and about acting from Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman? Wow, you guys don't mess around. <laughs> I like it. Well, from Clint, um, I learned how to not overthink. Uh, Clint says, you know, you, you, you prepare. Um, he says, I hire the people that I know who are right for the job, and um, you know what you're doing, and you've done your work, now let it go. And I think that's just such a great metaphor for life. You know, if you show up every day for your life, you understand what it is you're going after, and I have this motto of make a choice, make it happen, and work every single day towards whatever that goal is. You know, step into the sharp edges, do something that scares you, um, don't pull away, and, and don't overthink. So 
I got that, don't overthink from Clint, because you can really overthink yourself right out of something. There's a lot of what ifs that you, you, you think about that most times don't ever happen. Um, so there's that. And then with Morgan, he's just so, like, he's so, it's there's, it's, there's such an ease in which he does his stuff. I remember in one scene we had, it was the scene when um, we were in the, in the diner together, um, and it was my birthday, and he, um, I'm not my real birthday, but my character's birthday. And um, he was singing. He was just singing a song. It was like a Carmichael song. And then all of a sudden, he started doing the lines. And I was like, oh, OK. He wants to rehearse. And so I was in it with him. And then Clint was like, OK, that's enough of that. And they moved the camera. It was his take. And I just thought, wow, how beautiful is that? He just, again, he wasn't overthinking it, and he was just ease. He's the personification of ease, so. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could share with us if there's any common things, common steps, something that you always take when you, when you build a new character, discover a new character. Mm. Although you did a variety of things, but if there's something, there is. I. It's a great question, and I always find that you know, people are very specific, right? Every single person in here knows, you know, their childhood trauma and that one thing that happened that they can't ever get out of their head, and they know their favorite color, and they know the food that they don't like, and they know what it is that they want to have happen, right? We're specific, and I find that it's super important to find specificity in character. So I like to create a really vivid backstory that you you really bring into every single scene. And sometimes a, a, an actor will surprise you in improv, and then you're ready for that. Um, so finding the specificity of the character with all those, pretty much answering all those questions of what I just said um, that we know about ourselves. and um, and then breaking a scene down, breaking every single scene down. So one thing that I like to do is I take a story, the whole script, and I, for myself, not for anyone else in the movie or not for the director or anyone, I say, what is this movie about to my character? And I write that one sentence on the front of my script, and then all my scenes have to lead back to what that's, that is. And if I can't find that, then I have to sit down with the director and say, what is this scene about? And so just dissecting each scene and what it's about and what you want from it and what, what the obstacle is. And um, I love breaking my script down. It's, and I like at least four weeks to be able to do it. Thanks, it's fun. Hillary, would you then say that over the years, would preparedness have been your best defense against any kind of self-doubt that came up for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, um, no doubt about it. I, I, with, if, if I also, when I'm that prepared, I like to know my lines inside and out too. I know them because sometimes I get surprised by an emotion that comes up that I wasn't expecting, whether it's from another actor or, you know, or sometimes you're just really tired and your brain doesn't work and it's, you, you know, and so I like to be prepared so that, um, that I can, as we talked about, let go of my nerves in a different way. It doesn't mean my nerves aren't there. I'm completely, like, bef day before school, uh, what, you know, when you used to go to school and you couldn't go to bed the night before, that's me on every single film. And so the more prepared I am, it's just, it helps, it helps squash those, that, 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 those types of nerves and it allows me more room to play. On this side. Hi, Hilary. Hi. Uh, let me record this because this <laughs> that's great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, since your movie is about memories, I have a memory right here, and I wonder what are the memories in your life that you would like to forget and those that <laughs> you will never want to forget at all. Well, well, with you recording it, I'm never going to be able to forget it. <laughs> so maybe you should stop recording. <laughs> um, wow. What, 
wiggy. Wait, what do I want to forget? Well, the things I want to forget are probably the things I should remember because they're things that still need attention, probably. You know what I mean? Like, when we think about the stories that we've been talking about, real life stories of, you know, I don't like to remember that Tina Brandon was murdered, but I have to remember and we all have to remember so that it never happens again, you know? So I think I answered that question all in one. What do you want to forget and what can you not forget? <laughs> Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Holly. Um, do you ever find yourself uh, taking on sort of personality traits of any of the characters you've played before? Yes, but they usually find, then, then I usually find myself again, but yes. So, so I mean, when you're, it, it, we, a, a, a short day on a movie is 12 hours, and a normal day can be 14, 18 hours. So when you're in it like that, and then the other time that you're not in it, you're sleeping, you are walking differently, talking differently, and so that does become you for a little while. You don't just all of a sudden start walking like yourself again. But the great thing is, you know, and when I was doing the um, next Karate Kid, the one thing I didn't say was I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to find the emotion that that character had that I walked around a really disgruntled teenager. I, <laughs> I, was, I was, what do they call that when you're in character all the time? Method. Yeah, method. I thought that was method. Like, I was <laughs> her. And then I realized that is really exhausting. So <laughs> I try and let go at the end of the day. Um, but when you are in it, you're in it. And so it takes a little while to get out of it. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my question to you is, you took on a role like Boys Don't Cry way back when when there was such a stigma around humanity, you yeah. know? And um, I'm just wondering, like, were you scared when you were given the script that is your career gonna be over after this movie or if, if it wasn't executed well? That's a really, really good question and really thoughtful. And, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is there was no stigma for me because I am a straight person that people could relate with. And that's what's sad, you know, had I been, questioning my gender or gay, I probably would have been afraid of it because then I would have thought, oh, I'm gonna be, there's gonna be stigma around this and I'll never work again, you know? And thankfully, that's not the case anymore. You know, people are able to come out now and people are able to say, this is who I am now. But, um, so no, I didn't have any of that and I was really, really grateful for the opportunity to play, um, to play Tina Brandon and to understand, like I said, just to scratch the surface of what it was like to, 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 to live in that and walk in those shoes and see what that was like and expand my idea of humanity, my thoughts about the world. I was thinking about that when your movie came out and people were saying that your career is over. Like, I, and I was petrified. I was like, I can't believe that people are talking like that. Oh, that's interesting. And it was mainly, you know, the white, groups that just oh. felt that that movie should not have been made and I'm sure I am sure it was heartbreaking to see that you know that conversation go on so long ago but as people like you come about making brave films like this thank you because change does take a, a long time and it does it took 20 years but we're we're getting there yes we are thank yeah, you so thank you for thank you that. so much thank you I know that a couple of years ago you were dealing with family crisis mm -hmm. and jumping back into a film where once again it's child taking care of parent mm -hmm. and considering you know I'm currently in that role and to do it once is hard enough mm -hmm. so to relive it and react it is you know I can only imagine so did you find any difficulty coming back to something so similar that you came out of um First of all, I'm sorry that you're going through that and um, you know, I hope you're getting all the support you need to. Um, um, it was one of the most um, really life enriching things to help my dad through that, the hardest time of his life. And I was so grateful that I was in a position that I could take care of my dad and help my dad through that. 
Um, and I think probably is partly why I was drawn to the, to the, to, to the movie, even though that wasn't exactly her job. Um, and she, her brother was more of the caretaker. Um, it was definitely something that, that I thought about in, in a new way. And there's people all the time who are in that position who are being a caretaker. And doing interviews and talking about that and talking about how important it is for people in that position to also find support and that they are taking care of themselves too. It's just, it's just a life course. You know, we're born and someone's taking care of us, right? And then... All of a sudden, we're taking care of ourselves, and we're really strong, and then we're taking care of other people, and then we're taking care of our parents. It's kind of a life cycle, and um, it's a beautiful one if you really are present in it. And I was really, really honored with the opportunity to be in the movie and dealing with that in, in a different way. Thank you. Hi, Hillary. Hi. Hi. Um, I hope I don't regret asking this, um, but there's an episode of The Office um, <laughs> that centered around um, most of the characters, they have a debate about whether or not you're a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. I'm um, wondering if you've seen it and what your impression was of the episode. Well, um, I will start with saying I'm, I'm do you want to know because you want to know how that makes me feel? Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, I guess just, you know, being in your position, your image, of course. Um, your, well, I've your... certainly not played roles that are your typical, like, you know, it's not, I'm, I play real people. And I think beauty is very subjective. And I feel like no one would ever ask a man that. Um, and I used to get asked often in my interviews, you know, you're such a beautiful woman. You're sitting here and you're so beautiful. When are you going to play a pretty girl? Mm. And I, it just blew my mind because the women that I play are so beautiful in their, in their devotion and their um, perseverance and in their um, strengths. And to me, that's so beautiful. And I... I feel like um, a big part of growth that needs to take place, and that is, I think, taking place now, is that that's finally not asked anymore. And, um, and women have been so objectified for so long. Um, and, you know, to me, like I said, just beauty is within a person and how they choose to walk through their life. And um, so, I guess that's my answer to that. Hi, Hilary. Um, uh, my question for you is about overthinking. How do you um, identify uh, the line between necessary thinking and overthinking? Mm. What are your practical tips? It's a really, really good question. So, I would say that... Um, it's really important to think deeply about something, um, lots of things, and especially the things that are important to you. I think that there is a place for deep introspective thought, um, and especially um, talking it out with people and, and, and turning it over in your head and whatever it may be. But then I think where overthinking becomes negative is when you start thinking about the consequences of taking the action or the negative, the possible negative uh, things that could be associated with it. Instead of saying, this is something that I'm passionate about, thinking about it, thinking about how to make it happen, um, and then you fall into the fear thinking, the fearful thinking, and that's when overthinking becomes a negative. Does, does that make sense? So being thoughtful about something and really thinking about how to make it a part of your life and how to make that dream come true, but don't allow your overthinking of how it might not happen take over. Thank you. Hi, um, your work has been such a gift throughout the years and today and 
you just have this like instantly warm, generous, grounded presence, just even with us today. And it's Thank just so you. beautiful. Thank um, you. I'm just wondering how you maintain such a grounded presence when, when you've had such a claim and throughout all the swirling Thank you. madness of Hollywood and all of that. That's a really nice compliment. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I just, I'm just a person and I'm trying to figure it out just like everybody else. And I think once you get caught up into thinking that you're, I don't know, I don't know, something that is, can be put on you, that you're a celebrity and oh, you're this and oh, you're that. And you hear a lot of things about yourself and it's just, you have to continue to dissect what the truth is about you with your loved ones and the people that you surround yourself with and, and just, you know, remind you, I'm just, I'm just a person. I'm trying to figure it out, really. And, and I have such gratitude. I'm so grateful for getting opportunities and being prepared when my opportunities came about. You know, that's something else that I talk about a lot is preparing for your opportunities so that you're ready to embark on them when they come. But really, it's just about um, just being grateful, I think. I'm really curious to know what's next for you. I mean, you've done some absolutely incredible work. You're clearly evolving in terms of the scope of your responsibilities. What's next? Well, I would like to, I love, like I was saying, and taking time off to take care of my dad, I really, I don't know if I actually said that in this interview, but I, one of the things in stepping away, did I say that? N no, well, you mentioned it a little bit. So, well, just really, because I've done so many interviews today, I forgot if I said it here or not. But, um, <laughs> and, and making the choice to step away and take care of my dad, two things happened. One, I realized that I'm more than just an actor. You know, I was defined my whole life by being an actor, and that, of course, makes sense because that's what I do, and that's where I've gained so much of who I am. But in stepping away from it, I'd never not acted. In, there was not a year of my life since I was 15 years old that I hadn't performed. And so take, taking that step away, I, it was scary, but I also realized I'm so much more than just an actor. And I think that's really important for anyone, but especially for women, because we're so defined by what we do, right? Um, but then on the other hand, I also gave me a whole new appreciation for acting. I fell in love with it all over again in a totally different way, and then I got this opportunity to do what I love. So um, those two things happened, um, which leads me to answer your question, but I forgot what the question was. <laughs> what's next? Oh, so what's next? So in, in saying that, my, my point is, is that I love acting, and I've got reinvigorated about it. So there's that, but now I'm even more invigorated to tell more stories and to tell more stories about different people um, then you, you, we've been talking about this whole mm -hmm. time. So I've, I'm, I've, I've started a production company again, and I'm going to really be looking for stories that aren't just vehicles for me. They're just stories that I want to tell about all different types of people, all different types of walks of life. And so that's what's next. I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Thanks. And hopefully I'm here talking to you about all of them. I uh, absolutely loved you in New Year's Eve. Uh, actually, your whole rapport with Robert De Niro led me to kind of strengthen my uh, relationship with my father. Oh, so wow. thank I you. thank you with that. Uh, my question is, from all your work, what's been your most, I guess, difficult role emotionally and then for your physical craft in terms of doing the mechanics of it? And it may be the same role, it may not. And I know you brought up a lot of different roles today. I just was looking at the contrast, I would say. I would definitely say Boys Don't Cry because of all the things we've discussed tonight. Um, for sure, 100% emotionally and in a, in a big way physically too. Um, that was, I think, you know, perhaps maybe the most challenging role. And to say that, geez, that was really the first big opportunity that I got. But then, then doing Million Dollar Baby and uh, putting on 30 pounds of muscle as a vegetarian. <laughs> was really a challenge and working out, you know, five and a half hours a day, six days a week for three months and um, being super, uh, um, um, 
like diligent about the, the specifics of what you have to do to get your body to do that. And then you become aware of what you're actually capable of. And my biggest lesson on that movie was that I was my biggest obstacle and that I was getting in my own way because I would wake up and say, oh, I'm so tired, I can't do this. I don't, I, I don't think I can do it today. And if I had that attitude, I couldn't. And that was such a big lesson of, of saying, yeah, you can, you can do it. Just show up and see what happens. And every time that happened, I would break through an obstacle, whether it was emotional or physical. And so, you know, and, and that was, it's also a great thing as a woman to see what you're capable, what you're capable of doing physically. You know, that our bodies are made, they're, they're really machines. You can, you can really, um, that mind over matter, you can really make big changes for yourself. Thank you. Hi. What a great Hello. group. Is this on? Okay. <laughs> um, we've talked about all the strong female roles that you've played, and I was wondering if you could tell us the difference between being directed by a female and being directed by a male and how that affects your performance. And maybe even more specifically, if you've ever been in a female role being directed by a man and thought, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, another really good question. You guys are so thoughtful. Um, well, um, I, I never really thought about it as a gender thing. And when, I guess in, in thinking about it, I wasn't thinking, oh, that's not how a man would do it or that's how a woman would do it. I was just seeing, trying to understand their perspective of what it was. And oftentimes with either gender, you know, you have disagreements about how a scene should be or, um, you know, how it, feels authentic and it doesn't really have anything to do with gender, it just has to do with that story and where one thinks a character is at that point in time. And then you just have to talk through it and find your way. Um, but it's really, I'll, I'm actually gonna think about that the next time and think about um, if, there, if there is any type of, of kind of discrepancy of one thing or another. Because I, I just haven't ever thought about it. Sorry. <laughs> We have time for one more question. Hi. Yeah, you told us about all the auditions you have done and looking at your work, all the different roles you have played. Is there any topic you do not want to touch? And, and please don't say no, otherwise my question sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, is there any kind of character I don't want to play? Is that what you said? Yeah, any topic you don't want to touch on. Um, well... I never really thought about it like that. Um, you know, I, I have genres as an audience goer that I don't love. Um, you know, I'm not a big horror film fanatic. It's not, it's just I don't want to be scared like that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I who's to say that if Sam Raimi decided to make a horror movie again that I wouldn't jump at it. So. But I guess to kind of answer it, that would be the one genre that is not that exciting to me, a straight out horror movie without any substance of, you know, thought. I don't want to be chained to a toilet and <laughs> anywhere, anytime. <laughs> so. We've been so incredibly fortunate tonight to get um, the thoughtfulness and generosity of Hillary to give us these life lessons um, of tenacity to go get it, to be prepared, to be humble. There's so many lessons that we received today. Thank, Thank you. you so much for taking time Thank tonight. You. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Thank you. Thank you. You are so present and so thoughtful yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you.